The world was on the brink of war as Derek Jacobi entered it in October the 22nd, 1938 in Leytonstone, London, England. Changes would soon alter everyone's lifestyle, yet Hollywood and the American public were thronging to the movies for films that were not confronting the possibility of another war. America was laughing at Frank Capra's You Can't Take It With You, sobbing with Spencer Tracy in Boy's Town, hissing at Betty Davis and Jezebel. Then, too, America was watching closely at the search for an actress who could play the role of Scarlett O'Hara. In London, the classics were still going forth on the stage. John Gilgood was starring in The Merchant of Venice, and Laurence Olivier was playing Iago to Rafe Richardson's Othello. Into this changing scene, this world on the brink of war, came Derek Jacobi. And that moment in time that saw his entrance has been one of the forces that has enabled him to straddle past and present, past historical tragedies with contemporary problems. Derek Jacobi would later work with Olivier, would star in the great classics on both sides of the Atlantic, but he would also be able to bring to life the world of Nazi Germany, or the saga of a man who could break the German World War II code, or convince us all of the parallels and drama within the story of a Roman emperor. Derek Jacobi would be villain and hero, victim and victor, in stage, screen, and television events of the decades to come. The 1938 world, about to be caught up in the throes of torture and war and its difficult aftermath, was the world that became the theatrical heritage of this great actor. A man destined to one of the century's finest interpreters of heroism and cowardice. An extraordinary actor. Derek Jacobi, the man with the rainbow-colored mind. Um, always wanted to be an actor, ever since I was that high. Um, I was fortunate that I lived in London. I was born and bred in London, so I got taken to the theater. Not particularly by my parents, but by my teachers. Um, and uh, so I saw a lot of theater. Uh, when I was a child, and that just confirmed my belief that I wanted to be an actor. My parents were very untheatrical, they were very sort of unclassical too, and so when I ended up going to Cambridge, and um, acted all the time at Cambridge, I, I was supposedly studying history, but I acted all the time, and um, they again were very supportive. Um, I went to Cambridge really for two reasons. One was because it was a hotbed of acting. I knew that a lot of uh, aspiring young actors went to Cambridge. And B, it satisfied their desire for me to have a higher education so that if acting didn't work, I would have another string to my bow and I could teach history. Ha, ha, ha. Um, I didn't believe that was ever going to happen. He wanted to be an actor, I guess, ever since he was a child. I, I didn't get that as a fact. But when he went to Cambridge, there wasn't anything else that existed. He went on a scholarship and he did one play after another, after another, after another, not utilizing Cambridge for Cambridge, but Cambridge as a platform for what he was going to do and do very well. And yet Jacoby, I think, is, I think he's one of the most honest English actors I've ever seen in my life. And that, I don't mean to imply that other English actors are dishonest, but uh, he's very uniquely uh, uh, real on film. Well, this must mean that you're finally coming into the present. It means I'm on her mind, that's all. You were there. We could always regress you, Mr. Church. Take you back 40 years. Kenneth Branagh was directing and acting in Dead Again, a film that would become a suspense classic. And for Branagh, there was only one actor right for an important role in it. And he was determined to get that actor, no matter what problems were in the way. He said he'd got this 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 movie called Dead Again, and that um, he would love me to be in it, playing playing um, the the murderer. And uh, I couldn't because I was um, doing a, a Sartre play called Keen, 
which we were touring around and uh, coming to the old Vic with, and it was exactly the same time. So he said, thanks very much, and cast Donald Sutherland. Uh, well, I don't think they saw eye to eye. They only met once, but they, it, wasn't, it wasn't a happy occasion. And uh, so Ken decided, he looked at my schedule again, decided that Keane finished um, three weeks before the end of the shoot, that if Paramount would agree um, to do all those scenes and save all my scenes for the last three weeks of the shoot, um, then he'd still like me to do it. And Paramount agreed. Um, God bless them. And so I finished Keen, went straight to L.A., and the last three and a half weeks of the shoot were all my scenes. And, and that was Ken being very loyal and lovely and saying, you know, I'll go with the one I wanted originally anyway. Wonderful as a, as a villain who comes in and was the, pe the person people least expect. Funny, charming, witty, light-hearted, kind, apparently, you know, harmless, but with real steel in his, in his belly. Well, I, for one, <laughs> very interesting. They're very meaty parts. They're lo lovely parts to play. And, and particularly, you know, if you're a disguised villain, if, you, if, you, if for the most of the film you're pretending to be a, a rather nice, fuddy daddy old thing, <laughs> you know, who runs an antique shop, mm -hmm. and you're actually the brutal killer at the end. How does it feel to join the ranks of all the psychos now? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, yes, I, I get, um, you know, um, Remarks about scissors. Um, uh. I've, yet to, I've yet to die. No, lots of those. Lots of those. Um, and uh, with a great sense of fun. I mean, Derek is a great comedian. But one thing about Hannibal Lecter, you know, is, is, is that why didn't they give him an injection and take his teeth out? And why didn't they put him to sleep and just take all his teeth out? Give because him I think teeth. Derek, you suggested it and they did. <laughs> they got all upset no, about no it. No movie, no film. Three years after graduating from Cambridge in 1960, Derek Jacobi was discovered by whom most actors describe as the greatest actor of the 20th century, Sir Lawrence Olivier. He was every actor's hero, really, every young actor's hero. I'd seen him in, in the movies, and I'd seen, being a Londoner, a um, London schoolboy, I'd seen him on stage. I'd seen his Titus on stage, when he played it with Vivian Lee at the Stowell Theatre, which, alas, no longer exists, when I was a schoolboy. And so when I actually got to meet him as my future boss, director, co-actor. Um, it was a stunning moment. And I remember he and um, his wife, Joan Plowright, came down the line of the company. It was like a royal procession, and got to me and shook hands with all the company. And he did that eyeballing thing. And he looked directly into your eyes until, and kept talking until one of you would drop, and he wasn't certainly going to drop his eyes <laughs> until you know, you drop your eyes. And <laughs> um, by which time my shirt was sticking to my back, I was so frightened and in awe. I remained in awe, but he became a friend. I became a dear friend, but I was still in awe of him. He was always going on about finding my centre as an actor. And I think, of course, that is what actors uh, have to find. It, I'm beginning to find it now. I mean, 30 years later, I'm still looking for it. <laughs> I think it's around there somewhere, but I'm, I'm beginning to find it. Sir Lawrence, I think, was his was his template, wasn't he? I mean, he did have, he was following a master. We're so lucky, my generation, and, and Derek was just on the edge of it, that we had these people to follow. Yeah. Well, they were both great influences on me. I worked with both of them, particularly Olivier. Uh, with him, I worked for nine years um, as my director, my boss, my fellow actor, and ultimately my friend. And I worked with John um, on several Shakespeare productions. And uh, they were they were the same and different. Those two, they were they were the reverse of the same coin. Um, whereas John was very sensitive and very lyrical and very romantic. Um, Larry was uh, much more uh, courageous, more daring, um, more forthright, more aggressive. Um, but they both, in their own way, were stunning actors, and they both were very generous to me um, and enormously helpful and gave me many, many chances. And uh, it's sad that John has gone, but he had a, he had a wonderfully magical life, um, and he, he left it um, as gently as he lived it, and it was lovely, and he got to 96. They had a tribute for Kenneth Branagh, 
and um, I had to read a, a piece that um, John Gielwood had asked me to read. And I'd been down to see John, it was only about four months before he died last year, and he said, uh, who's going to be at this tribute? And I said, well, there's going to be Kenneth Branner, of course, because he's getting on. He oh, I don't really know Kenneth Branner. And I said, but, um, and there'll be Derek. Oh, I think Derek Jack will be the most wonderful actor. I so Derek was very pleased to hear that. And Olivier asked Derek Jacobi to appear in a production of St. Joan, and later that year was invited to become a founding member of the newly formed National Theatre, where Derek Jacobi made his London debut as Laertes, opposite Peter O'Toole in Hamlet. Was O'Toole's Hamlet an influence on your later interpretation? No. <laughs> the short answer is no. Um, uh, I... I think I was so much uh, involved with playing Laertes and um, getting to know and learn from Rosemary Harris that uh, I didn't really learn very much from, from, from Peter Sandman. I We only did 26 performances, um, most of which are my, my um, time with Peter on stage was mostly concerned with a fight in which I had to fight for my life because he never stuck to the routine that we'd, we'd arranged. Um, most of the time he got hurt, um, but I can't say that it, it, it was in, in that sense, no, no. Um, it, it was a very starry cast and I, and I think I learned most from um, Redgrave and, uh, and Rosie Harris, particularly from Rosie Harris. It was so strange to get cast as Ophelia because normally Ophelia is a very young little girl, you know, and um, I wasn't expecting to be in the company. I was on my way back to America. And I remember Sir Lawrence coming up to me once at Chichester in one evening, and he said, um, ah, we, we seem to be, we can't find the young little dewy things that we want to for Ophelia. And we're, Peter and I have been thinking that maybe she could be slightly older and that she could be Laertes' older sister rather than, her younger, than her, his younger sister and um, she could be a lady in waiting in the court rather than a young dewy-eyed little little girl and he, they said well would you would you consider would you like to do it and of course i mean how could i say no <laughs> it was a dream come true so i think with my relationship with derek was always one of the older sister because i don't think i was that much older than he was but i was a few years older and it was rather a nice relationship in the play that I was the one that was more concerned uh, for him. And then when he takes Ophelia aside and he says, now please be careful, dear sister, you know, while I'm away, it was very sweet of a younger brother looking after an older sister. How I know him is um, we have a, a very slight age difference, which meant that I hadn't become an actor yet or even really thought seriously becoming an actor. However, I was interested, and he was just starting his career um, in repertory, British repertory. I think it was the Birmingham Rep. And I was able to see this actor playing, which amazed me, always does different kinds of roles, um, you know, every two weeks or three weeks or whatever it was. And there was always a kind of talk in theatre, in theatre circles, that this young man was going to be a great actor. I think the very opening night, um, the, it wasn't that the set wouldn't turn round, it was that the curtain wouldn't go up. And it was the first time that the old Vic had ever had an electric curtain. Because always before there'd been the curtain puller, you know, standing in the wings and when he got his cue he would pull it all up. Well, they'd got all this new state-of-the-art um, stuff in, in, in the old Vic and it hadn't really sort of worked out its, its earwigs. And so I think it was on opening night, the audience sat there for about half an hour on one side of the Iron Curtain, and we <laughs> or stood on the other side, and we just waited. We had had a huge uh, Sean Kenny set on a revolve, and the set was a bit too heavy for the revolve, and uh, um, it wouldn't always go round, it wouldn't always revolve. And the opening scene on the battlements was very exciting because it was all up against the audience, right very close, and then it was supposed to turn and reveal Michael Redgrave and Diana Wynyard and all the courtiers and and Peter O'Toole in his little Lord Fauntleroy suit 
um, and me as a lady in waiting in, in the background, and uh, it wouldn't turn. And that was one of the funniest sights, because all the way through the show that night, it would never turn. So various members of the cast had to <laughs> climb down <laughs> and push it. But the good thing was that um, Sir Lawrence went on stage and explained to the audience, you know, that we were having trouble. And uh, I remember he had gout at the time, and he hobbled on with a stick. And uh, that was an added bonus to the audience, of course. They actually got to see and hear Sir Lawrence as well as see the play. I'm sure people have got masses of stories to tell about that production of Hamlet, but mine is a very personal one. But it does involve Derek, very, very much so, <laughs> because he has Laertes, of course, and I as Ophelia. Um, I was the dead body in, in the grave, and I was being pulled apart, by pulled backwards and forwards by Peter O'Toole. Uh, Sir Lawrence had had both Peter O'Toole as Hamlet and Derek as Laertes jump into the grave and have a fight with my body. And I was to sort of had my eyes closed, of course, and my long brown hair down here, and my arms crossed on my breast like this, and I was being pulled backwards and forwards. And the, to my horror, I suddenly felt my hair being tugged and tugged and tugged and I have obviously hadn't put it, my wig on very, very tight or maybe I would have been scalped otherwise but slowly my wig began to slip and slip and finally it came off completely. Um, of course I couldn't see any of this because my eyes were closed but there I must have been all covered in little tight pin curls and then this wig, this long haired wig had caught round Derek's uh, buttons on his, on his costume. <laughs> <laughs> and there he was, poor Laertes, <laughs> having scalped, <laughs> having tried to save his sister, <laughs> had succeeded in scalping <laughs> her dead body. <laughs> and then, of course, having got it off his sleeve, nobody knew what to do with it because they were all standing around looking into the grave pit and Diana, that darling Diana Wynyard was there saying, sweets to the sweet fair maid, you know, I hear of violets and I've done with this. And, of course, everybody was giggling their heads off because nobody knew what to do with this awful wig. It was like a terrible witch doctor's thing that was being passed around. <laughs> It was, a, it was a very funny moment. I think Derek will remember that. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, I'm sorry about the hour, but... Yes, Washington, I know it's seven o'clock there. It's midnight here. What? Well, could you call him at I the club? I'm terribly grateful for the work. I hadn't done, <laughs> mo I hadn't done movies, and... Uh... Really, and, and very few movie directors go to the theatre, it seemed to me. But one of the few directors that uh, was an avid theatre goer was Fred Zinnemann. And um, he'd been over the years many, many times to the National, and uh, in the course of his visits, seen me as a young actor. And uh, when he heard that I was leaving the National, offered me the part in Day of the Jackal. Um, and it was the first kind of big time movie I'd done where they kind of a limo drove you to the set, even though the set was a hundred yards up the road there. And I would say, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'll walk, I'll walk. No, 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 Mr. Zinema says, you get in the car. And suddenly I was in this whole movie world where everybody was fed, watered, and their ass was kissed three times a day. Um, it was totally unlike the, uh, the theatre, where you kind of did it all for yourself. Excuse me, have answer? Yes? Ralph's going to call. Ah, yes, I've been expecting you, Hercule. They just telephoned me to tell me you were coming. But I didn't expect you to be here quite so soon. You don't like to read the letter? I, of course, of course, the letter. <laughs> uh, come into the office. How long have you been here? I came directly from the station. Ah, good, good. Yeah, uh, do you have uh, a driving license? Yeah. I'm sorry, I should offer you a, a cigarette, but I, I don't smoke. There's a nice scene in, in the Odessa file with, with John Voight. Um, uh, and I enjoyed that to an extent, uh, to an extent, not as much as the other one. I think he came more in reputation than uh, his, uh, than my knowledge of his work. But I had uh, an idea that this was a brilliant, you know, character actor come to uh, give us a blessing on the set and uh, and indeed you know when I met him uh, I was very impressed with his uh, approach to the character and uh, his spirit you know good he was a real artist and you know when you come from I come from the States and I've had my training here in the States but the world is very small 
smaller every year. Uh, at that time, it was a little bit more separated, but not so much, you know. And of course, the um, my love for the British cinema was uh, uh, happened in my youth when I used to go to see Alec Guinness and and Laurence Olivier at a very specific theater that showed only British cinema. It's called the, the Pix Theater, and it was in White Plains, New York. And I, and I was a great moviegoer because my dad, who was a golf professional, was a, an avid moviegoer and used to take us to the films every Monday, which was his day off. And we would use up all the films, and then we would go to these special theaters. And when I was very young, you know, and I'm just talking about seven, eight, nine, I, I saw a lot of British cinema when I was a young fellow. And I had a great, great love for it. And uh, Derek was uh, introduced to me as one of the continuous line of these great British cinema actors. It was the young one coming up, you see. So that's how we, we met. And uh, he played a smaller role in, in this piece. And then I followed his career from that time. And of course, it was a, it's a wonderful thing to follow a young actor um, through his various uh, moments of c celebrity. Uh, and, and then it comes a time when people consider from the body of his work uh, that he is one of that legacy of the great English performers. And certainly he is one of those. He is one of those actors who dedicated himself to the theater. There was the, uh, there was the temptation of other things, uh, film and television, in a smaller way than it is today. But he, um, he's a theatre man, and that I admire, like, like the others. I mean, I will mention that the McKellens and uh, Ian Holmes, you know, and, and people who have um, developed to the top of their craft, they dedicated themselves to theatre. They weren't, at the beginning, tempted to go away. Uh, and this uh, has manifested it, it itself into the fact that uh, Derek is, is held now in such a high regard. Uh, he is, uh, you know, at the top. I admire that and I, in a way, envy it. And I had become friends with Tennessee Williams through the same, we had the same agent. And Tennessee wrote a play that he said he wanted me to do. And eventually I worked with Tennessee on it in Key West where Tennessee lived. I flew down to spend a, a week there. <laughs> and every night, Tennessee liked to go to bed quite early. So after dinner, we'd come back. And before I went out to meet other friends in Key West, Tennessee said, we must watch this wonderful television series, I, Claudius. And um, we watched almost the whole of I, Claudius sitting in Key West. And I told Derek, much later, he'd never met Tennessee Williams, and he couldn't believe that we were sitting in the tropics watching him give that wonderful performance in I, Claudius, which really turned him into a big star, a big international star, because it had such an enormous success. And his modesty remained exactly the same. A tragedy that one should lose one's father so young. Yes. Yes. Oh. tragedy for us all. Yes, and for Rome. You know, it must seem a far cry from I, Claudius, as we sit here along the Avon River with the Memorial Theatre in the foreground, Shakespeare's birthday. At the time you were taping this great BBC series, did you have any sense of destiny about it? No. But Lots of hope that it would work, um, that people would switch on, but really no sense of what it was to become, you know, this huge kind of mass market for it and the, the cult following it, particularly in America. No, we thought this was uh, an everyday story of Roman folk, uh, which would appeal to people who were uh, switched on to Roman history. Um, they were wonderful books, they were genius books, the, the two Claudius books. We were merely recreating them and hoping that uh, the public would uh, respond. The fact that they responded hugely and in, in vast numbers was um, a great surprise to me and I think to most, to most of the, the company. I was immensely impressed by his performance in I, Claudius on television, which I watched every time, every week, you know. It was absolutely gripping and his performance probably was most of the reason for that 
Well, like when he's doing, I, Claudius, I, I don't know. That's amazing what he was doing. You, you know, all the ticks and and uh, uh, stutterings and and emotional moments that he was doing. It was wonderful to see it. Uh, so beautifully orchestrated and it's great stuff. Lift him up, lads! Long live the Emperor Claudius! Let me go! Let me go! Now, don't worry, sir, you'll get used to it. It's not such a bad idea. Put this on him! Let me go! I don't want to be an Emperor! I want to be an About halfway through, I couldn't wait to become Emperor. <laughs> I, th I think the, the one I remember most, because we had most difficulty with it, I think, was the ending of Caligula. The, it was the bloodiest of them all. And I remember we were overrunning dreadfully uh, in the studio. And I, I had, it, it was a scene, I think, that was cut out in America, uh, where Caligula actually um, eats the fetus of um, the unborn child of his oh. wife. Um, I think it was cut out, but they showed it in England. And I had to paint John Hurt's face with the, the blood, you know, <laughs> because there weren't enough girls around, makeup girls around to do it, because we were all so busy. Um, that I remember, that's a, a vivid memory. If I can bring up one episode that was one of my favorites. I was just wondering exactly what happened during it. And that is, speaking of John Hurt, was the tutu scene. When oh, they when bring he, you when in, drag. goes yes, in drag yes, and comes before you. Yes. I mean, were you able to do this with a straight face? Not How long all. did it take Not to do Not at all. We, we overran that day too, because we, we, we giggled a lot, a lot. Because um, particularly when we first saw John, because we hadn't seen him, he came straight out of the makeup room. So you you didn't see him before this? Before no, he actually obviously did it, we rehearsed shooting. it, and um, but um, we had never seen his dance that he was taught. He wouldn't ever do it in rehearsals for us because he wanted it to be um, a surprise when we got there. And so we were surprised not only by his dance but by the sight of him. And I'm afraid we misbehaved dreadfully. <laughs> What was impressive to me as a somewhat nervous, shy newcomer to the series was the, uh, the ease and grace that he had in the rehearsal room, uh, always with plenty of time for everyone. Uh, you know, actors with a role like that can become very self-absorbed, if not self-obsessed, and, uh, and have every right to keep themselves private. Derek was generous with his time and uh, with his thoughts about the work and with his humor because of course he's a very funny man i have just the woman for you she's beautiful independent she'll leave you alone as much as you like <laughs> my sister alia she wouldn't want to marry a good um, who like me? Oh, she wouldn't mind. Besides, you're the Emperor's nephew. That's a good alliance for my family. And on your side, you'll be my brother-in-law. I don't think we had any sense at all of how spectacularly successful I, Claudius, would be. And Derek was that, was that wonderful, brilliant, still consistent center that held the whole magic box together. I think... Derek Jacobi's I, Claudius, was, was beautifully done. A, a man tortured, tormented, and his use of the, his, his physical use and his verbal use was wonderful. He's just trying to fool us. He still lives across the field, my old friend, Roche. The resistance man. But now he he goes out to his cows, so he'll see this light flashing on and off. The old in 1988, Jacobi won his first Emmy Award for the Graham Greene TV adaptation of The Tenth Man. An Emmy for drama was no surprise to the scores who appreciated the depths of Derek Jacobi's talents. Jacobi would go on to win a second Emmy, grabbing the statue for a comedy role opposite Kelsey Grammer in the TV sitcom, Frasier. If I may have your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, my brother, Niles Crane, and I had hoped to bring a great talent back to the stage. A truly, truly gifted actor. A man we greatly admire. Yes, 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 yes. 
he does deserve your applause, but in a tragedy befitting of the bard himself, it seems. <laughs> it seems he's ready to begin. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I bring you now to a hall in Elsinore Castle. At the Creative Arts Awards, Emmys were given in a number of categories. For guest actor in a comedy series, Victor Garber, Frasier. Sir Derek Jacobi, Frasier. Robert Loggia, Malcolm in the Middle. Gary Oldman, Friends. Michael York, The Lot. The Emmy for Guest Actor went to Sir Derek Jacobi, and please welcome... All right, welcome so we're here now to discuss the, the virtues and the time uh, achievement, career, if you will, of Sir Derek Jacobi. You're here. Oh, now, yes. of course, uh, I, I suppose we've all been fans of his, and of course we had the pleasure of working with him uh, yes. last year yes. on our humble show, if you will, and uh, we liked it. He, yes. he received an Emmy Award for his performance, which yes. of course I coached him through. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, it was his first time on television. Yes. He was so apologetic and charming, and yet, yeah. you know, really. He had to do a lot of Shakespeare. It was but a I lot more work than I thought well. it would be. <laughs> yeah, he did yeah. pretty well. Yeah, you know, he really, just, a, yeah. just a bit mm -hmm. hammy, yes. I thought. Well, you know. Well, I guess English, that was in the writing. English, yes. yeah. you know um, he was nervous. But, uh, it was very nice, though. Very down to earth. Very outgoing, us, charming. Told yeah. us to call him Sir Derek Jack. Right. right. Yeah. I thought that was yeah. pleasant, too. Yes, I know. Because we all expressed some, like, concern, a little discomfort about whether or not to call him Sir or just Derek. And he did say Sir Derek Jack. Halfway through the week, we didn't have to curtsy anymore. Remember no that? more curtsy. Said, Please yes. stop curtsying. No, nice. It was really very nice. Yeah, it, was very nice. It, it was really kind of a, a more of a patient thing, really, because yes. we are colonial. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> His handling of an audience. Uh, he, he could have been a great stand-up comedian, Derek. Fantastic timing. A brilliant, uh, he, he brilliant physical comedian. He's, he's, uh, uh, it's one of the things that makes him such a dazzling straight actor is that he has the genius when it comes to comedy. In little room, confining mighty men, mangling by starts the full course of their glory. Small time, but in that small, most greatly lived this star of England. Fortune made his sword, by which the world's best garden he achieved. And of it left his son, imperial lord, Henry VI, in infant bands crowned king of France and England did this king succeed. Whose state so many had the managing that they lost France and made his England bleed. Which oft our stage hath shown and for their sake in your fair minds let this acceptance in your great Henry V, how did you come to deciding on this kind of Brechtian style chorus for Derek? We wanted someone who would be very, very familiar with the text and be very easy with it, who would, from the word go, introduce the audience to a, a very relaxed and available delivery. They would feel comfortable about hearing Shakespeare in the cinema and who had warmth and genuine affection. Derek's always had that. It's no accident that he's a star and a huge theatrical star because of uh, charm, immense charm. He comes across footlights, he comes across the celluloid. People trust him, they like him. He's a good guy. And as the chorus, uh, he was able to be very naturalistic because we would go with him. We trusted him. And uh, he relished the idea of what is a speciality of his, which is making classical text sound very naturalistic. He's quite brilliant at that. And it was, uh, as much as anything, his great talent and capacity for that uh, uh, as anything else that allowed us to be a little more 
modern with the with the chorus for him to be more of a reporter and less of a kind of formal rhetorician. Oh, pardon. And let us ciphers to this great account on your imaginary forces work. What is your thoughts that now must deck our kings? Carry them here and there, jumping all times, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. Or the wits to fly, admit me, chorus to this history. Who, prologue-like, your humble patience pray, gently to hear, kindly to judge, our play! I think that's the only part I've ever turned down because I, I couldn't believe they meant me. Uh, there didn't seem to be anything about me physically, uh, personality-wise, that, that, was, that was Hitler. And I, and I was taken out and wined and dined and I said to them, finally, look, you've got X dollars on this, this film. Uh, why you're not in the business of wasting your money? Why have you chosen me? Can you tell me why you've chosen me? out of all the actors you could have chosen for for um, Hitler? And they said, "Well, we are doing a particular Hitler. We are doing Albert Speer's Hitler." And Albert Speer, in his book, paints a picture of Hitler, which is much more sympathetic than any other picture of Hitler we've ever heard. Um, he says in the book that, you know, the Hitler considered him, if Hitler did have a friend, it would have been Albert Speer. Um, they shared this great art artistic um, world together. And um, it was also a picture of Hitler in his uh, moments of relaxation. Um, it was a domestic Hitler. In a sense, it was Hitler trying to be endearing. It was Hitler doing um, bad impressions of uh, New Year's telegrams from leaders around the world and all his cronies laughing hysterically at his bad impressions. Um, but it, it was, in a sense, a sympathetic portrait of Hitler. So it was also, this was the clincher for me, they said it was a man, Speer described, a man who was an actor, who knew he was acting. and. Even some of the great rages were acted, rages. So we want an actor to act Hitler and to be seen acting. You're an actor, get on with it. I am talking about calamities tonight because I want to put an end to these calamities. Help me. Give me your trust and your confidence and I promise you, you will never repent it. He said, we'll make you look like him. Anybody can look like Hitler, but you dye your hair, Put that, put that, a <laughs> uh, lot of that, and you'll look like him. We promise you, you'll, you'll look enough like him anyway. Um, so then they took me out to, uh, then I said yes, they took me out to Bavaria. They gave me an office, and I had a television screen and <clears throat> the little remote control, and I had piles and piles and piles of cassettes of all the, the stuff. He was one of the most photographed leaders that, that there has ever been. Um, and I spent three weeks clocking in, nine till five every day, watching these uh, cassettes, some wonderful secret captured Russian stuff on him, and, and literally copying. I mean, literally copying what he did with his hands and uh, um, his face. And, and then the, the, the very first thing I had to do, the very first day's shooting for me was a recreation of uh, an extract from the Lenny Riefenstahl film, um, The Power of the Will, um, you know, at, at mm -hmm. Nuremberg, where the camera goes below uh, that rostrum and he's up there doing his thing. And then they would, which was the real Hitler, then they came in close and it was me. Uh, and we did it at the end of the day, I remember, in an empty studio. And I had to do the full Fuhrer bit and I was terrified, and they kept me in a caravan all day. And uh, it was my first bit of filming. The, f the first time anybody had seen me dressed as Hitler, 
they, anybody had heard me say a line as Hitler, and I had to strike 12. And that, that was difficult. That was very difficult. And from then on, nothing was as hard as that. He has extraordinary technique. I don't know an actor who has the God-given gift of being able to read a page once and knowing it. He has photographic memory, which means that when he starts a part of great weight and great length, he'll come to the first rehearsal really prepared. He knows the part. It's already sat in his soul, and he's ready to go from there with that particular inner life. And that's a great gift. He also has the gift of mobility. I've never seen an actor with as much physical and mental coordination so that the movements and the mind and everything becomes whole, one. And then he has the spiritual uh, gift of of making contact with an audience so that they understand what's going on, not only here, he not only communicates, but he shares. And an audience feels this. It's a kind of empathy between him and this mysterious beast out there, which is the audience. I first worked with Derek um, in 1974, I think it was, at, uh, at Chichester in um, Toby Robertson's production of A Month in the Country, Turgenev. And uh, we took that the following year into, into London, to the Albury Theatre, uh, and uh, played it in repertoire with uh, uh, Richard Cottrell's version of um, A Room with a View. And uh, then we went and did that play about the two gay hairdressers, uh, uh, Staircase and Charles Dyer, which um, uh, we had a lot of fun with. I guess it's, it's one of those plays that's slightly more fun to be in than to watch, you know, but, um, <laughs> but we, we loved it. And uh, we did a... We did a tour of it. Nobody came, but we, we had a great time. And, and then it was the 1977 um, Hamlet year. Jacoby reminds me of Chris Plummer, in which I've seen Chris, I've worked with Chris, I've seen Chris in films, I've seen Chris on stage, and Chris is someone who can fill a stage, and he knows how to act on stage, and he knows how to completely change that and act in film, uh, and make it real, and make it full and, and interesting. And, uh, and Jacoby, I think, has the same gift. But, you know, he was very meticulous, and, and that, he knew what he wanted. He, was, he came in to do his work, and he was caring about it. It wasn't as if he just came in and just did it off the top of his head. He was at, at work, and that's, uh, of course, how, how he does his great stuff, too. My biggest regret this past year was that Derek and I were going to do a new play called The Visitor. He was to play the visitor, and I was to play the reason for this beard, Sigmund Freud. And the discussions between the two are, were remarkable and beautifully written. Unfortunately, when they blew up the two towers and the money faded away, we, we, the, the project was put aside. I, I, I regret not playing with Derek, because I, I would have been, felt great, great fun doing it with him. Uh, he's a wonderful actor, and I don't care where he gets it. People say, well, it's inborn, it's genetic, it's talent, it's, it's all of those things. Uh, when I go to London, I always feel a little more intelligent for some reason, because they, they tend to stimulate me, they tend to irritate me or aggravate me, or the use and command of the language is wonderful, and I feel pretty poor sometimes in relation to them. But I, I have great respect for the English actors. In 1980, Derek Jacobi made his Broadway debut in the short-lived The Suicide. And in 1982, joined the Royal Shakespeare Company, earning roles of Prospero in The Tempest, the title role of Cyrano de Bergerac, and Benedict in Much Ado About Nothing which later went on to Broadway to earn a Tony Award for his work. Had you met, had you met Derek Jacobi before your collaboration on Much Ado About Nothing, no. Serrano at all? So that was the first that time? That was the first time. I mean, I, he was a completely unknown quantity to me, except, you know, watching him on stage or television. I, I knew him, as we all did, from I, Claudius. I had seen his Hamlet. So I knew the stature of the man, but um, I had no idea whether we would collaborate well or whether we would be a good Beatrice and Benedict or a good Cyrano and Roxanne. I had no idea. And then it turned, for me, anyway, it was magic. Hurry, friend! Oh. I hit 
I need a rhyme to hold the shape. Gape the fish. I'm going to wind the reel. My rod is lasting if I break the sharp tooth slavers for its meal. There, let it strike. Ha! Did you feel it bite? Not yet. The vulture ah! until the closing of the deal. The poem ends, and then I hit. Oh, what? I found a challenge in playing uh, Cyrano de Bergerac, um, which requires um, an enormous vocal technique. I mean, just as much as, as Hamlet does. I think it's just as much of a, a mountain as Hamlet, actually, Cyrano. Yeah. The friendly, it must dip into your cup. You need a nasal crane to hoist it up. The pure descriptive, from its size and shape, I'd say it was a rock, a bluff, a cape, a cape, no, a peninsula. How picturesque. He, he gave so much as Cyrano. His was such a... It was just a magnificent performance, full of colour and, um, and complexity. Derek had his kind of modesty that... I, I'm sure it has been noted by everybody. But it's unique because actors live off their own sense of themselves and sense of excitement. And Derek never, never uh, uh, exploits it personally. He, he always saves it for the stage. When I went back to see him the first time, I remember I uh, was greeted by the man who played this gallant, extraordinary Cyrano, and the man who answered the dressing room door looked like a cheery doctor from, from uh, Harley Street. <laughs> and I thought, where's Derek Jacobi? And he said, how do you do? I'm Derek Jacobi. <laughs> I, I called my agent the next day and I said, that was the most extraordinary experience. I mean, my heart almost stopped when I saw him act, and then it almost stopped again when I met him. It was another person. And that fits in very well with Derek, Derek's feeling about himself as an actor. He is a character actor. There are two kinds of actors, as you know, the kind of actor who's himself, the personality, and everything comes from himself to the part. And Derek has that thing of bringing everything from himself to a character and has the character speak for him. And he saves all the drama and all the theatricality for stage, which is a very modest and a kind of exciting thing to watch. Another tour de force performance was given by Derek Jacobi a year later as Alan Turning in Breaking the Code, which was subsequently filmed for television. I adored Breaking the Code. It was... It was so wonderful after years of being in classic revivals, not just Shakespeare, but Chekhov, Ibsen, whatever, of actually getting to talk to the dramatist and asking the playwright what he meant and working with the playwright on a script and wearing a pair of trousers and uh, it was just glorious. I loved it. He did, he did Breaking the Code with such extraordinary comprehension and he described his uh, character to me as the man with the rainbow-colored mind. And I thought of that and I said, wow, that's Derek Jacobi, the man with the rainbow-colored mind. Because Derek has this extraordinary quickness. He thinks very quickly. And when, what he goes for on stage is, as he told me, relaxation and energy so that the mind can go even more quickly on stage. And those are qualities that really shine in his technique. My favorite memories of Breaking the Code are watching the play, because I was, in, I was only in the first scene. I played Christopher, his, um, Alan Turing's uh, first love, who dies very young. So I was in the first scene with, with Derek and Rachel. Um, and then I died of tuberculosis. And, sat in the wings from then on and watched the rest of the play. Um, I, don't, I don't recall many nights not watching the play. Um, I had homework. I was in college at Fordham University uh, in the Bronx at the time, so I had a lot of subways and homework. But I don't recall ever not watching the play in the, from the wings because it was 
uh, riveting. What he what he did in that play it was riveting. I remember I one of my great possessions, my treasure possessions, is a letter I got from Stephen Sondheim, uh, having seen Breaking the Code in New York, and it it. It was a very simple letter, but it said, I always, I always thought that, that acting was an, an interpretive art. There are rare occasions when an actor crosses the creative line and actually adds something to a text that wasn't there, but adds it in, in, a, in a good way. And um, he said, I saw you do that last night. Derek was uh, was alive, and uh, I mean, unforgettably alive, and um, thankfully, because I I was afraid this was going to be dry and and uh, scary for me, because I was walking into something that obviously had been pre-planned, and I was just a pawn and and uh, replaceable, I guess. I, I don't know how I felt, but but. Once the scene started and Derek was looking at me, and this passion came into his eyes uh, for me, for for the role I was playing, uh, I knew that uh, it was going to be a pretty exciting road. <laughs> anyway, the point is this: it would be foolish to pretend that your homosexuality hasn't created problems and certain anxieties. For whom? But providing we can discuss the situation reasonably, I feel sure that these anxieties can be reduced to a minimum. What anxieties? As I say, it's simply a question of keeping in touch. You're talking about security problems. Jacoby has this scene with this political operative that's played by Harold Pinter, and the guy is basically saying to him, you know, well, now we're going to require something different from you with all of your years of service to the government in code breaking and so forth and, and uh, uh, you know, high security clearance work. And now we're going to be treating you a little differently because you're a homosexual. And uh, in that scene, uh, Jacoby has this monologue, he has this speech with all of this passion and all of this velocity about how they achieved the code-breaking machine, how they came up with the Enigma machine. And uh, you have to have a tremendous amount of skill to make a monologue about mathematics and about computer manufacturing uh, passionate. You have to be a very talented actor to make that soar and make it real. Because when Jacoby does it, he could be talking about uh, sex or wine or food or uh, you know painting or music uh, but he invests so much that's passionate and real and I think that in terms of those two things for film acting to be passionate to an appropriate degree and to be real and interesting uh, I think that he's a one of the best that I've ever seen at that Jacoby is this incredibly uh, real film actor. He's one of the most real British film actors I've ever seen. Oh, he, he came to my house, my house, don't forget, perfectly well aware that we would almost certainly end up in bed together. I didn't, didn't come to any great surprise to him. He's had other homosexual experiences. I, it's ludicrous talking about criminal offences. And uh, I, everything happened here, in private, in my own house, in private. This is madness. No Roman army has entered the capital in a hundred years. Exactly. I will not trade one dictatorship for another. The time for half measures and talk is over, Senator. And after your glorious coup, what then? You'll take your 5,000 warriors and leave? I will leave. The soldiers will stay for your protection under the command of the Senate. So? Once all of Rome is yours, you'll just give it back to the people. Tell me why. The film Gladiator was made in, on the island of Malta. Um, I was there for, well, and in England, and in Morocco. I was only on the Malta bit, and I was there for nearly three months. And uh, it was, I suppose, my first taste of the big Hollywood epic, and it was very exciting. 
It was also, conversely, very boring because there was a lot of sitting around. Um, and although when you see the film it looks very exciting in the Colosseum, sitting there day after day, day after day in the boiling sun for hours and hours and hours got tedious beyond belief. Um, a tedium that was shared by the 3,000, 4,000 extras too. Um, but at other times it was, it was very exciting. It was very exciting to see how it all was put together, how they made it all. We had, um, of course, one tragedy when, when uh, Oliver Reed died during the course of the shooting. And uh, he was digitally uh, put into the last shot of the film. Uh, which was uh, very spooky, really, because soon they won't need actors at all. They can, they can do all kinds of clever things and won't need us. Um, I enjoyed uh, the work very much. Um, I enjoyed working with those other actors that were involved. But films of that sort that need huge setups um, are basically boring to make. It looks exciting when it's all put together, when it's all edited together, uh, and it's all timed and everything. But, um, I mean, the scene with those, with the tigers in, in the, um, the Colosseum, uh, they were so drugged, they hardly moved. Um, they were lying down most of the time. And then you see the movie, and they're jumping up at Russell Crowe, and... <laughs> It wasn't like that, you know, it's the magic of the movies. They say the camera never lies, it lies its teeth out. Barbara Jefford played Gertrude to Derek Jacobi's Hamlet in 1977 at the Prospect Theatre Company. My first impressions of him were that he was an extremely lively and expressive person, which qualities he brought into his performance of Hamlet. He was also able to convey, which not all actors are able to convey, the quality of nobility. He was a prince, but a very volatile prince. I'd already played the part of Gertrude at the National Theatre with Albert Finney as Hamlet. And uh, that, I can tell you, was a very different kettle of fish. He was kind of of the earth, earthy. Derek had much more spirit, and I greatly admired his performance. I didn't find that the way we worked was different at all. Both having done quite a lot of classical plays, we were on the same wavelength. And I found working with him extremely exciting, always from the beginning right up until the end of our various perambulations with the play, because we played it not only in, uh, in England, at the Old Vic, um, but in Edinburgh, and then we toured it. We toured Germany with it, we toured uh, the Middle East with it, and uh, it was always exciting, and I always admired his, his handling of the part. I played Hamlet um, many times, and uh, each one has had years in between for me, presumably to mature, presumably to learn and gain experience and get better at it, um, and so time has certainly influenced each time I played it. I played it first as a schoolboy. Um, and what I, I um, lacked in, in technique and finesse and craft and skill, I made up in noise. I was very loud, passionate and very emotional. Um, and very energetic. Energy is, energy is quite attractive on stage, actually. Well, in, in any performing art, energy is uh, very attractive. But um, as time went on, I calmed down a bit, and I, and I um, learned uh, to work from the inside out, I suppose. Um, but what is good about the classical realms is that there is no definitive performance, and actors like to revisit the big roles and do them over and over again. And the public quite like to see actors having another go and comparing them to what they did before. One of the things that Derek was not frightened to do with that Hamlet was to make him ugly, was to make him unpleasant, mean-spirited, vengeful, uh, uncontrolled. Uh, it, it, it's a bold move for an actor to take. 
so there were times when you felt to be in the presence of somebody who 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 was so uncomfortable to be around you could hardly blame Claudius for wanting to send him away to England he was such an embarrassment and Derek played that and it was fabulous he was also by the way while I remember he was the funniest Hamlet I've ever seen I, I, I've never seen any actor get that much humor out of the role the king right what right you with false fire that's my lord give her the plate give me some light I asked quietly and politely for a torch and took it in my hand and walked over very close right up to Derek's face holding the torch <laughs> to illuminate his face and looked into his face for a long time <laughs> with a mixture of sadness and pity and regret and some embarrassment before turning quietly and walking off the stage leaving him uh, with all of his plan somehow <laughs> unfulfilled you know he was uh, he was waiting for something dramatic and, and uh, self-incriminating to happen to to the king and it didn't and uh, when we rehearsed this and it began to feel good to me I I, I was thrilled by the 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 readiness and the, the 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 seeming pleasure with which Derek embraced that particular idea. Um, were I never to see him again or to work with him again, uh, the the sheer fun and thrill of that moment will always stay with me. In 1988, Derek Jacobi, just as Sir Lawrence Olivier did for him, directed a promising young actor in another production of Hamlet. That actor was Kenneth Branagh and the two developed a prosperous working relationship as well as a lasting friendship. My earliest recollections were seeing, were, like many people, I suppose I, Claudius, where I was dazzled by a performance that I thought was um, um, without uh, peer. It was, uh, it was moving, funny, uh, extravagant at times. Um, when I met him, which I did when I was uh, uh, around that time when I was about to be a student and go to RADA, he was very kind to uh, a 17 year old who was uh, uh, nervous about the profession and asking him all sorts of silly questions and uh, is, was aware and is always aware that you've got to start somewhere he always gives people a helping hand and, and uh, support he's very aware of having been in that position himself he won't stand for any cruelty from directors he sticks up for people he's, uh, he's a good guy He's been very good to me. <laughs> we're, we're good to each other, really. Um, um, Ken and I go back when I was playing Hamlet at the the, um, the old Vic in 1979. I got a call from uh, a, a RADA student saying, "Could he come and interview me for RADA's magazine or something?" Um, he came, and obviously it was Ken. And uh, he said that uh, two years before he'd seen me play Hamlet at the New Theatre Oxford, um, that he was, at that time, um, couldn't decide whether to be a journalist or an actor. And he saw this production of Hamlet and said that absolutely convinced him he wanted to be an actor. And he wanted to play Hamlet. And um, so I was, he said, and you're responsible for doing that to me, so yeah, I want to talk to you about that. And uh, then we fast forward. And uh, he became an actor, and very quickly he became a successful actor, and um, decided that he wanted to do his first professional Hamlet, and got in touch with me and said, do you remember me? And um, I said, yes, I, I've, um, I do remember you. And he said, well, would you direct Hamlet for me? Would you direct my Hamlet? So I did. Can you tell us about Derek Jacobi's directorial debut of your Hamlet? Yes, I can. Derek uh, and I discussed the possibility of him directing a uh, Shakespeare play for our Renaissance Theatre Company in its early days. We talked a way back about Richard II with another actor playing the lead, and uh, Derek felt he wasn't ready to do that, but very much wanted to do Hamlet, a play that he knew very well from his own massive experience in the part and, and in other roles in the play. And so we, we met in New York when he was playing in Breaking the Code, and we began to talk about the, the part. I'd seen his own Hamlet, the prospect version, um, um, several times, uh, the second prospect version, and, um, 
and also seen his television version, which is in which he's also excellent, been profoundly moved. Um, so it was a great thrill for me to be directed by someone who had been a great Hamlet himself and knew the play really inside out. I mean, really knows it word for word, every character's part, and had a strong view on how the story should be told and how particularly uh, characters that are sometimes neglected um, should be brought to the fore. He was very generous about telling Gertrude's story, Ophelia's story, those people who didn't always say uh, as much as uh, the central character but whose stories and journeys through the play were very fascinating. And to me, he was a fantastic director, incredibly enthusiastic and kind, very sensitive to what the the actor was uh, going through in a large part like that and very aware of how necessary it was to pace oneself in a great role and his knowledge of that of when to just take a breather of when to um, you know not always strike 12 uh, in a role that can tempt one to do just that was invaluable um, he's always been very um, uh, kind and uh, available in that way so he was a terrific director I've not done a great deal of directing um, uh, what I've done, I've enjoyed, but it's, it's uh, convinced me that I'm an actor. Uh, I'm not a director. Uh, I, enjoy, I enjoy doing it. I enjoy acting. Because um, I find directing is interesting, exciting, but then it stops. And the actors take the play away and put it in front of an audience. And they, ultimately, they know more about it because they have experienced that journey in front of an audience, which the director hasn't. Um, and it's like having a baby and then giving it away. And uh, so I, I, prefer, I prefer acting to directing. You said you saw his Hamlet in 77 at the Prospect. And now that you've done it with him and he's directed you in it, how much do you think of his Hamlet played a part in yours? He, as a director, edited choices that I'd made. He never imposed things on me. Um, I think that his Hamlet was more genuinely mad during the antique disposition um, uh, period. I think that he was more dangerously insane. More dangerous, actually. I think that mine was a little more reasoned, rational, not um, for any particular reason. It was just the way it developed. Um, but uh, I think it's hard to know how much it influenced me. I think Derek's own great spiritual manners and decency and uh, princeliness was the thing that I took from him, um, so that there was always a sweet and tender prince, I think, in both performances. Working with Olivier as a director drew the greatest praise from Derek Jacobi, but such praise did not follow for the director of a new film called The Human Factor. It appeared to be a promising role, and the director had already achieved acclaim for his work on such a wide range of films as Laura, Anatomy of a Murder, and Advise and Consent. But Derek Jacobi found no pleasure working with Mr. Otto Preminger. Um, I think money was a bit tight. None of us ever got paid for it. I mean, years later, there were still great court cases with equity. The only one who got paid was John Gilgood, who got the cash in the hot hand on the day. Did his, but I think he was only on it a couple of days or something. But uh, the rest of us didn't. And uh, um, no, my memories of that, of, of, of Preminger as a monster, I have to say. I mean, he was monstrous. He was monstrous to the crew. He was... Um, particularly the, the weakest members of the crew. Uh, he was pretty monstrous with actors, particularly with uh, actresses. Um, it was hell. I hated working for him. And, uh, and I think everybody felt that, you know. I mean, Nico could look after himself. Nico had this, this awful thing of doing of, uh, he, he's a marvelous mimic. And he'd come up behind you, pretending to be Preminger. And the blood would run cold. And you turned around and it was Nico. Uh, no, it wasn't a happy time. I don't think, um, and I've had experiences of it in the theatre too, that you can terrorise performances out of people. Some directors um, uh, try to um, indulge their own neuroses in their work. Um, and a lot of that neurosis comes uh, through, um, they, they find relief in terrorising actors and making actors unhappy and thinking that actors can only get their creative juices going from a sense of absolute terror. Uh, and insecurity, and that's what produces good acting. It's balls, mm -hmm. and uh, Mr. Preminger was one of those, I'm afraid. Reputation. Reputation. Reputation! I have lost my reputation! I have lost the immortal part, sir, of myself. 
You know, the Olivia name certainly comes up again when we realize that you, your first appearance on the screen was Othello. How much was saved from the stage to screen? Oh, a lot. A lot. Um, uh, it was recreated kind of in, in 3D for, for the uh, mm -hmm. um, screen. It was a th just a three-dimensional version of what we did on the stage. And uh, it was interesting, really, because on, on, on stage, for my money, Olivier was wonderful and gargantuan and you, uh, totally riveting. In the movie, Iago comes off better. Frank comes off better, for me. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I don't know, it was, it was maybe Frank's film technique or something, or the, that, that um, Sir's performance was, was so geared to the stage that he found it difficult to pull it back for the screen. But it's, it's a bit big for the screen. I've never seen <laughs> Why do you speak so startlingly and rash? It's lost, it's gone. Sneak, is it out of the way? Oh, heaven bless us. Say you? I say it is not lost, but what if it were? Uh, I say it is not lost. Fetch it, let me see it. Why, so I can, sir, but I will not now. This is a trick to put me from my suit. I pray you let Cassio be received again. Fetch me the handkerchief, my mind mistake. I pray you, talk me of Cassio. The handkerchief! Come, come, you'll never meet a more sufficient man. The handkerchief! A man who all this time has found it his good fortunes on your own. I remember um, you? one occasion, <laughs> you one crazy. occasion when, when um, God suddenly acquired feet of clay for me, um, which was wonderful because he just became another actor. He'd be, he, I, although I stayed in awe of him for, for all my life, he, he, uh, this moment became just another actor because he came off after the handkerchief scene and he would always have, he played it bare feet and he would have slip on slippers waiting in the wings so that he wouldn't tread on nails and things. And after the handkerchief scene, uh, I'm playing Cassio and um, Frank is playing Argo and we're waiting to come on. And he used to come off at the end of that and either put his hand on Frank's shoulder or mine, slip into his slippers and shuffle off. Um, this particular night, he played the handkerchief scene, and he played it to the top of his bent, and he came off to great applause, I mean, huge applause. And as he leant on my shoulder and slipped his feet into his slippers, he said, oh, Christ, what the fuck can I do for my next exit? <laughs> and it was a typical actor's remark, you know, he peaked too soon, and now we've got to go on again and do better. And they'd love that. So what, what could he do for the next scene? You know, so he was just, a, just an old ham, like the rest of us, really. <laughs> the thing that impresses you most when you work with Derek is his energy and his single-mindedness, his, the way all his energies are um, focused in on the part, on, on, um, on getting rehearsals right, and then when you get into performance, his whole day is structured towards the evening's performance. It was a great honour. It is a, a knighthood is a great honour. I wasn't expecting it. It was a great surprise. I was very flattered. I thought long and hard about accepting because I think uh, it changes other people's perception of you, and uh, that can be dangerous. But then I thought, well, it's how how I react to it, how I use it. Um, um, I've uh, I'm still a bit ill at ease with it. Um, I can never refer to myself with it. I still say mister. I can't actually call myself sir. I find it doesn't sit in my mouth very well. Um, but I'm enormously proud of it, yes. And uh, it can be used to, um, to good effect um, in, in several ways. And uh, um, I don't, but I don't flaunt it. I don't. It hasn't made me a better actor, uh, certainly. Um, it, it doesn't bestow on me any, any uh, greater talent or greater importance. Um, it's just very nice to have that kind of reward. But then I came to America and pretty much stayed there and then I kept hearing these wonderful snippets of news of that Derek was now doing this and Derek was now doing that and I said of course you know it's of course why wouldn't he be it it was it was predictable that he would he knew he he knew where he wanted to go and he he just he went with it.
And of course he is. And of course when he got knighted, I just couldn't believe it. My little baby brother as Laertes, now Sir Derek. That was very exciting. Working with Olivier as much as you have, opposed to the American system, do you think they both can blend in some way? Can you take pieces from it? Can you take all of what Olivier told you and still use the other as well? The, the quality that we are leaving out is the audience. We do it for them. We do not do it for us. We do not, it is not masturbation in public. It's for them to have the, to be feeling it. Watching, I, if, what, however you approach that, if you're Olivier, if, if you're Eli Wallach, uh, if, if you are a method actor, if you, if you are a realistic actor or a formal actor, whatever sort of actor you are, mm -hmm. the bottom line is what are they doing? What are they thinking? What are they feeling? What sort of a time are they having? And that's the be-all and the end-all. It's not uh, up there being bravura and wonderful and getting your rocks off and crying and thinking, God, I did that ah. well tonight because I actually cried. Fine for you. Yeah, great for you. What sort of a time were they having? And often actors kind of get into this masturbatory state where it's, it's, they're having a great time and they're not really um, doing it for anybody but themselves. And... Uh, that's, I'm getting a bit heated, aren't I? No. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that's wrong, I think. I mean, I think we must always, when we're talking in a high, rather a highfalutin way about acting, remember the paying public, remember the, the customers. Because exactly. that's who we do it for. The method has, has become a kind of great blanket word. Exactly. Um, yeah. Which is uh, not really viable anymore. I mean, the method that Stanislavski wrote it down was, was merely tabulating what most actors do instinctively. Mm -hmm. But he just put number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. Uh, but they, they were the sort of things that we all should be doing anyway, mm -hmm. you know. And, but to take that and say, and say that that is the, the American um, approach, the American method, um, English actors do it as well, but they call it something different. Mm -hmm. But I think we all we all, our journey is to get in there, to get inside there, find out what's in there, what it's all about, and be able to recreate it. Not once, but eight times a week, twice on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, Gielgud's old phrase about, you know, some, that, that if you were doing um, eight Hamlets a week, sometimes you've got to send technique on. You can't actually live spiritually and emotionally and psychologically um, and mentally that inhabit that character. Jacoby has been able to fuse both ways and both approaches in the acting. He has great sincerity, great insight into the characters and is unafraid to play them. Uh, I saw him do, I, I, funny, funnily when he says breaking the code, which was the play he did, He's broken the code in a way. He's, he's sifted out what, what he feels is he could use in the method, and he's adapted it and fused it with a British approach to acting. And that makes it very, very interesting. Damned without redemption! Dogs easily want to fall on any man! A great Shakespearean work and a triumph for Derek Jacobi. But it was simply not enough to do just Richard II. Yes, there were things he still wanted to do with the part, and so he decided to do it again. He returned to Richard II, but decided to do it back to back with a new production of Richard III. Richard II is a part that you would imagine Derek Jacobi playing. It has all his natural qualities, um, the wonderful verse speaking, the delicacy, the nobility again, this natural kingship, which he has, which he had in Hamlet. Richard III wasn't anybody's idea of a Derek Jacobi role, and he was really surprising in it. I have a picture in my mind's eye always of him. When I came on as Queen Margaret, he was standing near the proscenium uh, at the left-hand side, our left, um, in that terrible kind of spider-like way that 
Richards tend to stand because of the because of the the hump in the, in the arm. And uh, he snarled at me from from that position. And we had quite a little kind of battle. And that you see with the, within the two plays, the two productions was our only exchange when she has more or less gone mad and he's taunting her. And that was quite exciting. I was. I say, I say surprised, but it's not insulting to say I was surprised. I was impressed and, uh, and surprised at um, the way Derek had uh, developed and expanded his talent. He was, I thought he was tremendously good in both, in both parts. Again, I saw it a few times because again, my, my wife was in it. She was playing Queen Margaret in one and I think the Duchess of York in the other. So I saw it quite a few times, and uh, it was a remarkably good performance. I, I think that the, the Richard III, the stand comparison with, uh, certainly with Olivier's, really, and got an immense amount of humour out of it, as, as Olivier did, but it was a different sort of humour. It was everything that the part should be. Derek was very funny as Richard III. Um, and that humor did take one into the evil side of him uh, because it is like on the flip of a coin. Um, but I think his more interesting, uh, the more interesting evening for me out of the two, in fact, was Richard II. Um, because Derek has some wonderful qualities of, I, I keep using this word, lyric. I don't mean it to sound uh, in any sense uh, fey or, or slight or uh, un of the present. Uh, what I mean is that it's something that it's a quality that actually moves one emotionally but also intellectually. I think that's what to me lyricism is. And I think Derek can, could do, can do, and did do in Richard II. He did that very well. I always notice with Derek that. Uh even when he hadn't played a role before, he was always very quick on the lines, very quick to, to know his lines, which I always uh, taxed him with as being unfair. And he, I remember saying this to him when we were rehearsing Richard III in, in, uh, in Aberdeen, I think it was, when we were on tour. You know it already, that's not fair. He said, oh, but you see, I have to, I have to. And whether it's his method, whether he can't kind of concentrate properly until the lines are tucked away in his head or whether just because he had two enormous parts to play, whether that made it necessary for him to do, I don't know. Anyway, I always admired his, him for being a very quick study. Boredom as a factor in the long run is something that uh, you learn to avoid. Uh, that's one of the great disciplines of acting um, in a theatre. Uh, night after night, week after week, month after month, each one, each performance has got to be approached as the first time. It is the first time for most of the audience. So in order to keep sane yourself, you have to stand in the wings and say, look, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what I'm going to say, um, don't know what, I can, what I'm going to find out there. It's all going to be fresh and an adventure. Um, <clears throat> you have to take that mental attitude. Um, also, I rather like the routine of it. I quite enjoy routine. The security of routine, I like. Um, and uh, that you certainly get in the long run. But it's something you must be aware of and work at. Um, not to get stale, not to get lazy. Each performance you can learn something. It might be something so minute, but each performance teaches you something. Oh, I play a goody this time. Ah. I'm, I'm, I'm a 12th century monk who's a detective, and he, uh, various things happen um, in and around the, the Abbey of Shrewsbury, where he's uh, um, a Benedictine brother. They're based on uh, a series of books by a lady called Ellis Peters, um, and they're very popular in America. Um, the Chronicles of Brother Cantor, there are 20 of them. Why should it be? Like castle and town, we are also besieged. But in our case, it's the innocent and the dispossessed. And they, they had to tonsure my head. They had to cut a three and a half inch circle, which they shaved every day. Um, 
wasn't very keen on that. And we went to Budapest for three and a half months, which was lovely, to film it in the studios there. They built the sets there and in locations around Budapest. Um, I, miss, I miss the filming very much because uh, we did five seasons of it. Oh, they were all filmed in Budapest, in, in Hungary. Um, and it was lovely going there each year for ten weeks, doing the filming. Um, and I love Budapest. And I'm, I miss Kato very much. I mean, I, I grew very fond of him. And uh, we had these marvellous sets built in the uh, studios just outside Budapest, which were left there um, each year. And, of course, as each year passed, all the seasons, they weathered and they became more so real and, and it was just you felt you were going back into the 12th century every time you went back it was it was lovely do you prefer wearing a beard or not I, wearing one um i prefer not wearing one but um since the chin line is sagging, <laughs> I probably won't continue because it's very good for the chin line. <laughs> Trouble is, it came out grey this time. <laughs> success upon success in film and television only energised Derek Jacobi. His thoughts again returned to the Bard. The result was his version of Macbeth. Still another triumph. The acclaim once again added Jacobi's name to the greats of the Shakespearean heritage. We had talked about his Mac Macbeth, and you don't say Macbeth, I, I'm sorry to say that. You talk about it, you say it's the Scottish play, <laughs> because everyone is fearful of the energy that surrounds that piece. But obviously, the great Derek didn't, that's all baloney, he didn't worry about that, he charged in and did a brilliant piece of work on it. Derek is a, you know, has, in the best sense, a ferocious ambition. He always has had. It's an ambition to be better, to be the best he can be. Um, he's got the ambition of a true artist, and uh, and I think that he fueled that into his Macbeth, which was the most searingly clear and brilliant reading of the role I've ever seen. I mean, it was the most intelligent and uh, uh, extraordinary rendition of the of the text, and uh, I think it's it's it's. It's really the fault. It's the it's the problem with the critic to you know simply through dint of association with a certain kind of uh, personality to to feel the actor can't uh, provide the rest of it. In Derek's case, I find it thrilling to watch him play those parts. Um, I didn't see, but would long to have seen him play Richard the Third. I'd love to see him play Iago. I think that um, there are always such surprises when apparently uh, generous and benevolent people suddenly pull out the stops as villains. It's thrilling. In 1977, I still smoked. I'd have a quick drag when I came off. Um, it was only, it was two years later in 79 when I realised that I had no no future career as a classical actor if I carried on smoking, because already I was, you know, I was getting a bit like that. And I certainly couldn't do what I'm doing now, eight eight Macbeths a week, um, if I if I'd smoked. So 15 years ago, thank goodness I gave up. Derek has a. Uh uh, away and this is and by the way this is the legacy of the great English actors that they approach the role they interpret it um, in a certain way of a strong interpretation of the piece that brings out the text uh, and, and it's different it's carefully planned it's um, you know uh, orchestrated in a certain way so that you have that growth through the performance this is not this is why Americans sometimes fail in those classic pieces, and most especially in Shakespeare. It's not that we don't have great actors, because we do have great actors, but sometimes, uh, and, and there is the lack of familiarity with uh, approaching verse. There's much to be said about our lack in that area. But over and above that, there's a certain kind of architect architecture that is passed down. The uh, British actors know how Olivier did it, or how Gielgud approached it, or Ralph Richardson, or Keane, or, you know, they, they have that kind of body of understanding. So when they approach a role, it's not as if they're, they're approaching it from a dead start. They, they know how it's been approached and how these scenes had to be solved and were solved by individual performers. So Derek is of that mold. He knows the, the language of others as they approach it. He knows what the problems are that exist, how you have to solve those scenes to interpret the next scenes. And uh, if he charges in and does that role, you can 
rest assured that he has a very strong feeling for how he is going to approach it with his instrument, and, and therefore you're going to get, uh, you know, you're going to get the play solved for you in that evening. It's just joy to work with, and I have nothing but fond memories. And as an actor, he's extraordinary because he makes Shakespeare completely available. The first time I saw Derek in rehearsal, um, I was astonished. He sits on the side reading his Guardian newspaper and doing the crossword, <laughs> almost with pipe and slippers, except he didn't have pipe and slippers, but that's how he looked. And then he'd, he'd stand up in the rehearsal room and he would speak Shakespeare as if it were his own vernacular, as if it were his own speech patterns. Um, I found that astonishing. You know, I have to, well, most actors have to struggle quite hard to make Shakespeare sound spontaneous and, and real. Derek just doesn't like that. Crossword puzzles are, are a passion with me, but um, particularly the Times crossword puzzle, but uh, they are strictly... Um, just, dressing room. You would never, But never. even in the dressing room, I mean, to, to think that an actor can actually go back to his dressing room and even do them, in particular not, if you're doing something like Richard III. Yeah, but, you do, but not doing a, a, a show you don't. I mean, uh -huh. you, I, I, I would do them perhaps in, in the afternoon or... But if, if the show's going up at 7.30, come um, 5.36, mm -hmm. crosswords out oh yes no 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 there i find them a marvelous way of relaxing and um keeping my as, as my gray matter and my brain cells drop off the perch the odor i get it's a nice way of keeping them jangling and, and on edge but i would certainly mm -hmm. um stop it about two hours before the show not that i think you did not love your father but that i know love is begun by time and that I see in passages of proof. Time qualifies the spark and fire of it. There lives within the very flame of love a kind of wick or snuff. The public knew Derek Jacobi as an important actor who had already done his Hamlet. Now Claudius's character was the one he wanted to probe. He got that chance when Kenneth Branagh announced that he would play Hamlet in a new film. Derek Jacobi came on board as Claudius, and another powerful performance resulted. Jacobi had now succeeded with Claudius. Uh, Claudius is a very difficult part. It's a part that has um, uh, scuppered many an actor. Many a, um, an actor has found it hard to play because so much of the part is cut out, of, uh, the text is removed to, to shorten it to three, and, three hours or three and a bit hours that uh, Derek, uh, as br uh, absolutely brilliant performance, uh, unquestionably brilliant performance. Um, he, because he was able to do the full text, you saw the full arc of the man. You were able to understand why he did what he did. There, was no sort of, there were no sort of uh, short moments just to show you, uh, which meant that the part was fulfilled as what, in, in fact, the whole production of Hamlet, the whole film of Hamlet, uh, which I'm uh, very proud to have known so many people who are in it, uh, because I do think it is the most wonderful record, and I do think that in time to come, it will still be regarded as the most wonderful uh, filmed production of Hamlet. I think energy is, is, is supremely important for an actor. Uh, I think um, once you're up there, uh, you tend you tend to start thinking at the speed of light, or you should be able to think at the speed of light, because anything can happen, and you've got to cope with anything happening up there, with all those people watching you. And it's the fact that there are so many eyes on you that makes you very, very aware. Your antennae are, are very well honed. A cough is an exocet missile going off. A sweet unwrapping is a terrible comment on your performance. A cough is a, another terrible comment on your performance. Um, you're acutely aware of noise, um, of, of uh, atmosphere, uh, of silence. Um, that's sometimes the, the best, that deep, deep, tangible silence that uh, you can induce with an audience. It um, doesn't happen that often. When it does, it's wonderful. But that means you've got to be very much alive emotionally and physically and really energized.
very important. His performances are always of that consistent um, energy and, uh, and commitment and um, speed. Critics, ah, yes, my answer is going to be very short on this. Um, I don't read them um, because uh, if they're good, uh, you go on and start playing the review. If they're bad, you want to kill yourself. Um, Chekhov, um, I'm doing a, a Chekhov play at the moment. Um, and he referred to the critics, you know, you, I, I can't remember the words, but you have a pride of lions. Or he called it a miasma of critics. And that, to me, absolutely um, sums them up. Uh, I don't think they contribute very much to our art form. I don't read reviews. And that was one of the things that maybe Derek remembers from me, is that I think one of the things I taught him, I don't know whether he still... Um, goes by that, but I had learnt not ever to read reviews, certainly not on the second night or even the second week. And so while everyone else was sort of pulling their hair and saying, oh gosh, you know, we didn't do very well, I was oblivious. I thought we had had a wonderful success. Uh, what feelings are running through Derek Jacobi at this time <laughs> during his life? Huh? Oh, I'm a bit chilly, actually. Um, <laughs> uh, but then that's... Uh part of the cause at Stratford. I think um, I'm grateful that I'm still going and that I'm still in work and that I've been, I've been touch wood, one of the luckiest actors I have known. I've been given the opportunity to strut whatever stuff I've got. I've been employed and so for that I'm very grateful and I've been employed twice in this theatre which was always my ambition to be part of, to act Shakespeare in Stratford-on-Avon is the best and to act um, the parts that I've been given here has been sensational. Derek Jacobi is extraordinary in that he's one of the few actors I know who makes the transition between fantasy and reality and lives totally in the fantasy, which is what he says pleases him more than anything else in the world, which is to live in his own fantasy. And yet, in life, he's the most down-to-earth, real, solid, life-enhancing, actor I've ever worked with. It's always a treat to see him. His modesty is unaltered, but he's become a really extraordinary actor, and it's wonderful to think of him rolling around on the grass with Maggie Smith in Chichester 40 years ago. I'm very proud to know him. He has his very, very strong presence in today's world. So I tip my hat to him because he's... Uh, it's, it's funny, you know, you, when you're young, as, it, as we were both uh, together when we were youngish, uh, and we had a little bit of attention at that time for our work, and uh, over the years, you know, he's made a great contribution. His body of work is quite impressive. I admire the fact that he had worked his way through to where he is by not being tempted by anything else but his love and devotion to the theatre. I'd, I'd love to do a film that took everybody by surprise. Films like Bonnie and Clyde, The Graduate, uh, films that sort of came from nowhere and made people, made the actors that were part of them. That sort of part I would like. It's out there somewhere. <laughs> I've been very blessed in my career. I've been incredibly lucky. I know you need other things than luck. Um, you need, certainly need health. You need some talent. But I think what you need more, most of all are the opportunities to start whatever stuff you've got to start. And I've been given those opportunities. I've had enormous luck. So my downs in my career have been very, very few and far between. I suppose the worst time for me was after my three years at the Birmingham Rep. And I, I, I wanted, I felt I was a classical actor, I wanted to be a classical actor. The natural progression from Birmingham was to go to Stratford on Avon, which was only 20 miles away. And I was invited to go to Stratford to play tiny parts, to start, um, in three Shakespeare plays. So I gave up my job at Birmingham, said Stratford have called, I'm off to Stratford, and they said fine, go with our blessing. I've, I had to finish my season with, with Birmingham, and then 
they asked me to go over to Stratford to meet them all, which I did. And they asked me to read Ariel in The Tempest. They hadn't told me they were going to do this. And I read Ariel very badly, like a sick choir boy. And they wrote a letter saying they didn't want me. So I had to go back to Birmingham and say, can I have my job back? Because Stratford doesn't want me. Um, and that was the worst time. And Birmingham is full of canals. And I gazed longingly at that water sometimes. Uh, yeah, I was re really down. Um, I got to Stratford, but it took me 20 years. That's a mile a year. Uh, but I made it eventually. William Shakespeare is buried here at Holy Trinity Church, Stratford-upon-Avon, England. For the world's greatest poet playwright, his work ended here. But his plays live on, brought to life on the stage by a work of a succession of brilliant actors, David Garrick, Edmund Keane, Laurence Olivier, John Gilgood. And now, Sir Derek Jacobin. Oh, Derek, one last thing. May I have your autograph? 